We now move on to questions to the Minister of Education and to inform members that questions 2 and 12 have been withdrawn. I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Ms. Dobson. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number 1. I understand that in light of legal advice received by the North Eastern Education Library Board following litigation in which an issue surrounding home education arose, the Education Library Board reviewed the arrangements for ensuring that the parents of children and young people who are actively home educated provide an efficient and suitable full-time education for their children. Yes, and I call Joanne Dobbs. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But he cannot be oblivious to the very real concern which exists among home educators. Therefore, would he agree with me that proposing massive changes based on an interpretation of the law, which is not shared by the educational authorities in England, Wales or Scotland, is potentially damaging? And can he confirm to the House if he has sought legal advice on this issue? Um, well, this is not England, Wales or Scotland. Uh, we have our own legislation in relation to education, including home education. There is currently a consultation going on. And I have to say, while I keep an open mind in terms of the, of the consultation and the guidance which will be issued by the Education and Library Boards, I have a concern that the vast majority of people who have spoken on this matter in this House have spoken on the needs of the adult and not on the needs of the child. Can everyone in this chamber reassure themselves? In what way do you reassure yourself that the child who has been home educated is being properly home educated? How do you reassure yourself of that? Because it appears to me that everyone who has spoken in this matter thus far has, is completely reassured, have no hesitation whatsoever in endorsing the current uh, gains and saying that yes, children are being properly home educated. We can reassure ourselves 100 per cent that every case they're being properly home educated. However, in my initial answer to the member, it has been rather been brought as far as litigation against one of the boards that that was not the case. So therefore, we have a legal duty to make sure we are doing it properly, and I think we also have a moral duty to make sure we're doing it properly as well. Mr. Mervyn Story. Uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, I think it's disappointing that the Education Minister has cast a slur on parents who educate their children at home and make that choice. I think he should seriously reflect on what he has said in this House today. But will the Minister confirm that representatives from his department attended meetings of the Strategic Regional Group in regards to this particular issue? Well, Mr Storey continues to have selective hearing as well as selective policies towards education. I have not cast a slur on parents here involved in home education. What I am saying is what I am saying is what I am saying is, am saying is Order. It is very difficult, uh, Deputy Speaker, to, because if uh, people who wish to be ministers but can't make their role of minister continue to interrupt me, it is very hard to, to do uh, question time. So there's, there's, he, uh, he appears desperately to require the spot box in front of him. Perhaps the first minister has just left and will be treating somebody to the spot box. So, uh, what I said was that we have a duty of cure to the children involved, and we do have a duty of cure to the children involved. And there, I've already pointed out in my original answer that this has reached litigation stage, that this has entered the, the realms of law, and the law has said that the guidance requires to be reviewed. The Education and Library Boards have taken that on board and reviewed. Now, I have not got in front of me a diary of every meeting my officials have ever attended, nor do I wish to have a diary of every meeting my officials have ever attended. But I do regret the fact that the boards did not present me with the, the consultation documents before issuing. However, I believe that the consultation should continue, and at the end of it, I have committed to this House and to others to ensure that the guidance will be signed off by me if I am satisfied that it is in compliance with the legislation. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And I wonder, uh, could the Minister tell us what arrangements are currently in place to monitor the education provided to children at home? Uh, the current arrangements are roughly as follows, or broadly as follows. The boards have advised that they do not undertake inspections of home education. While the Education and Training Inspector provides inspection services for a number of organisations, it does not undertake inspections of home education provision. 
The boards have in place various arrangements to monitor the education provided to children who are educated at home. This includes annual visits to the child's home, reviewing samples of the child's work, and providing advice to parents on how to support their child's education. I understand that the board's draft home education gauging document does not include any reference to inspection process, but proposes that each board will undertake monitoring which will focus on the child's welfare, ensuring the child has access to education suited to their age, ability and aptitude, and the provision of advice to parents on educational resources. Three points which I find it would be very difficult for anybody in the House to disagree with. That the boards should not monitor the child's welfare, ensuring the child has access to education suitable to their age, and the provision of advice to parents on educational resources. Now, is, is members opposite uh, and to my left, physically rather than politically, uh, suggesting that that should not be the case? I, I, I do not see any difficulties in any of those three matters. But we will assure, and I have said this and I repeat myself again, and we will assure that whatever guidance that is issued is in compliance with the law. Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister, considering there has been no public advertising of the uh, consultation process for elective home education, how would parents who are considering elective home education for their children know about the consultation process? Um, I have not got the full details of how the programme was advertised, but I think it is fair to say that the consultation process has garnered sufficient publicity. I have answered questions on in the House now on several occasions. I have quite a healthy uh, mailbag in relation to uh, home education, and members are also asking questions about it. So it is out there. People are aware of it. Uh, and, and responses are being made to the consultation. If there are ways to improve knowledge around the consultation, I will advise the boards of that. But I emphasise this is a board consultation. The Education and Library Boards have taken upon this consultation. Uh, my only role at this stage now will be to ensure that I am satisfied that the final guidance is in compliance with the legislation. Thank you. And I call Ms. McKilla Boyle. Uh, the Anti-Bullying Forum comprises departmental and ELB officials, along with representatives of around 20 voluntary sector organisations. Each has a particular interest or expertise in these issues, and collectively the Anti-Bullying Forum aims to tackle bullying within our schools and communities. Over the last year, the Anti-Bullying Forum worked with 7,000 pupils in 37 schools to raise awareness and provide anti-bullying training. It has engaged with over 1,000 young people in 26 non uh, school settings, providing workshops and presentations to youth groups, office schools, clubs and community organisations. The forum has held 10 seminars aimed at enhancing anti-bullying policies and practices in schools, attracting 283 school leaders from across all ELBs and school types. 640 schools and 77 organisations took part in the Anti-Bullying Forum's Anti-Bullying Week 2013, and over 1,700 children submitted entries for the art and creative writing competition held as part of this. At my request, the forum also undertook a review of current anti-bullying legislation, existing guidance to schools, current policies and practices within schools, and those specialist support services available. I intend to consider all the priority work areas identified. By the review, my officials are in discussions with the forum to agree a joint work programme for 2014 and beyond. However, it is my intention to bring forward anti-bullying legislation to this House during this mandate. Boyle for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his response? And can the Minister further clarify what issues did the Forum review and identify as priorities uh, to be taken forward? And was there a timeline for doing so? Uh, the review identified four priority issues wide variations in the quality of current school anti-bullying policies, inconsistent recording of incidents of bullying, a need for additional resources to address particularly complex issues such as cyberbullying, the need for research to identify the true scale and nature of the problem. Uh, as I have said, I, I intend to consider all these areas to see what actions can be taken forward, both in the short and long term. Uh, my officials are in discussion with the Forum to agree a joint work programme uh, for the 14-15 year and beyond. And as I said, that will include bringing forward legislation to the House to tighten up our anti-bullying legislation. Mr. Sammy Wilson. Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, 
The Minister has indicated that he, in, he does intend to bring forward some uh, legislation in the future. Can he give us an assurance that the legislation will be framed in such a way as to ensure that the maintained sector is as equally uh, held accountable as the controlled sector would be uh, when it comes to this legislation, given the fact that there seems to be a much looser um, ability for the schools in the maintained sector to uh, take um, an attitude towards bullying, which uh, would not be tolerated in some of the uh, controlled sector schools? Uh, there is absolutely no evidence to support that statement. Absolutely no evidence to support that statement whatsoever. Uh, and regardless of which sector or which school bad practice takes place in, bad practice should not be taking place. Uh, and the current legislation does stipulate that every school has to have an anti-bullying policy. Uh, it is the quality and rigour of those anti-bullying policies that have been called into question, uh, both by the research carried out by the anti-bullying forum and other anecdotal uh, evidence that comes to hand, which is one of the reasons why I believe why we have to move towards bringing forward uh, tighter legislation to this House to protect young people from the impacts of bullying upon their lives. Uh, but there's no evidence to support Mr Wilson's statement, and I can assure him any legislation I bring forward will be there to cover all sectors within education, uh, as would be the case under equality legislation, uh, any legislation which is brought forward before this House. To Colin Ishwood. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, ministers, the Minister for his answers uh, thus far. Uh, research tells us, Minister, that um, in order to tackle bullying effectively, it needs to be done in a cross-departmental uh, way. Can, I, can, you, can you tell the, the House uh, what kind of work you've done with other uh, departments and other ministers around cyberbullying in particular? Um, I work in relation to, along with the Health Minister, in the, in the anti uh, in the pro-life group in terms of suicide prevention group uh, and one of the areas that has been covered in that is in relation to cyberbullying etc and across a, a wide spectrum uh, of areas and how we tackle an ever-growing and ever-changing phenomenon which can be carried out across cyberbullying so we am involved in that as are uh, a significant number of other executive ministers and we will continue to engage uh, at that level. Uh, bullying takes many forms and shapes. Uh, it can be caused and brought about by individuals for many, many different reasons. And we often find that those who are carrying out the bullying are also facing significant challenges with either within their home life, family life, or other aspects of their life as well. But we have to ensure that schools have in place proper policies to help prevent and tackle bullying when it occurs. And there's many, I have to say also, there's many, many fine examples out there of schools being proactive in challenging uh, the perception of bullying, challenging uh, bullying behaviour and errat helping to eradicate bullying from their schools. So, while there has been in recent days examples of perhaps poor practice, there are certainly many, many examples of good practice out there as well. I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you for your answers so far, Minister. Uh, Minister, the party to which you belong introduced an anti-bullying private member's bill in Doyle Aaron. And strangely, as yet, you haven't sought to bring similar standards here. Do you accept that failure to act on this issue, for whatever reason, is having particularly negative consequences for the tackling of homophobic bullying across Northern Ireland? Well, I, I welcome the member's interest in Dáil Éireann. I welcome the member's interest in my party's uh, All Ireland policies. Uh, and one of the reasons why I have already indicated to my colleague, uh, Michaela Boyle, that I am introducing legislation is because part of the anti-bullying forum's remit of the review they carried out was to look at the possibility of introducing legislation, and it appears to me that uh, is the way forward. So I have taken steps to work towards the introduction of legislation. However, I want to make sure we have the proper legislation in place, legislation that is effective, and effective against all forms of bullying, including homophobic bullying. And I have to say this, however, we do not need legislation now. Homophobic bullying is wrong and should be tackled by schools, and they have the powers to do so. I call Mr. Danny Kinnahan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four. Yes. Yes. Deputy Principal Speaker, you have competition for your job. 
Mr. Campbell is now earning to be behind the desk as well as behind his dispatch box as well. It's, it's, there is, it's, a, it's really a pity for him. Uh, Crumlin Integrated College entered the formal intervention process on the 1st of February 2010. The most recent follow-up inspection at the school was in March 2014, and the inspector reported that the quality of education provided by the school is now good. I welcome the fact that the school has contained to, continued to show steady improvement since the original inspection in January 2010. The Department is now considering whether the school should exit the formal intervention process. It is imperative that the decision taken is fully considered and is in the best interest of the young people attending the school. Future post-primary education in the Crumlin is a responsibility in the first instance of the North Eastern Education Board, working closely with other stakeholders. On the 11th of June, the Board announced that it supports the concept of shared post-primary education in the town. A business case for shared education will be prepared by the Board and other potential stakeholders. It will establish whether such provision can be valuable and sustainable and meet the educational needs of pupils going into the future. A development proposal or proposals will be presented to the Board before the end of October this year, I understand. The date for a possible change will be September 2016. Should a new management model be proposed, it would represent a significant change to the character of the school. The Board, as a managing authority, would therefore have to publish a development proposal. This proposal would then come to me for consideration. Mr. Kinahan for a supplement. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. And I congratulate the school on how well they've done, and thank the North Eastern Education Library Board and Working Party for all the work they're doing. And we have a very positive future for the school. But there's still one thing that I need the Minister to try and work on is that how we get positive statements from the boards and the department that stop the parents bleeding away to other schools. We've got a very positive future out there, but it still leaves doubt in people's minds. We've got to get rid of the doubt, make people believe the school's going to exist. Will he and his department take that on board and find a way to be positive about the whole future? Well, uh, I, I'm not on record, I understand, of saying anything negative in relation to this school. There has been inspection reports, and the inspection reports have found, have published their findings. Now, the latest inspection report has said that the education of the school is good. My department have to make uh, some decisions in relation to whether it should exit the formal intervention process or not, and we will, my officials will make uh, that decision as quickly as possible. Um, there are positive developments in the sense that I welcome the fact that through the North East Education Library Board and other stakeholders, there is this advanced planning in relation to uh, schooling uh, in the Crumlin area, and I welcome that very much. But I'm limited in what I can say in relation to any possible development proposals that are published, as, after all, I will be the final decision maker upon them. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula Bradley. OK, question five. <coughs> um, all preschool providers are responsible for setting their own admissions criteria in accordance with guidance supplied by the Department of Education. The Preschool Education and Schools Admissions Criteria Regulations 1999, however, require providers to give priority to children from socially disadvantaged circumstances. Research has shown that children from socially disadvantaged circumstances tend to experience more difficulty at school than other children, so they are given priority in preschool admissions processes as part of my wider effort to tackle educational underachievement. Social disadvantage is currently defined as parents in receipt of certain benefits. Approximately 24 per cent of children in preschool settings across the North meet these criteria. In many settings, however, this percentage is much lower. The review of preschools at missions recommended that the definition of socially disadvantaged circumstances be examined with a view to mirroring the relevant economic elements of the definition of free school maze entitlement. This is an area which will be reviewed, and I will want to ensure that there remains a process which is fair and transparent to ensure that those children who are most at risk of educational underachievement are encouraged and supported from the outset. Ms. Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, would the Minister agree that the current criteria in which you say yourself um, gives preference to those who are social, uh, social disadvantage discrim discriminates, uh, discriminates against many working families who themselves are socially disadvantaged and are on the breadline themselves? And can you give some sort of justification for that? Well, I think in terms of the criteria for social disadvantage, the current uh, criteria is limited to income support or income-based job seek allowance or an award of income support which has been converted into an employment and support allowance 
and the level benefit remains the same. I, I would like to broaden that. I would like to broaden it to low-income families who are working. Uh, but what has caused a delay in broadening that is the issue of welfare reform and where that issue will be settled and how it will be settled. Uh, so I certainly want to ensure that children who are facing educational barriers such as social disadvantage, whether their parents are low-income workers or in terms of low-income on, on benefits, I want to include those uh, in the criteria. So there is work to be done there, and we await the, the outcome in relation to discussions around welfare reform and how that model will be settled. Mr. Chris Hazard. I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, given that a large number of members in this House seem willfully blind to the legacy of poverty and indeed social deprivation, can I ask the Minister to reiterate why it's important the preschool admission place uh, acknowledges the effects of such? Um, the research tells us this to be the case. And indeed, uh, the member is a member of the, the Public Accounts Committee, which recently published a report. Uh, and one of their reports indicated the need to target and tackle social disadvantage, as it is having a detrimental impact on young children who are from socially dis disadvantaged backgrounds. And it was one of the reasons why I made the changes to the common funding formula. It is an internationally recognised concept as well. Uh, I have reflected a number of times to the House uh, my visits to Canada. Uh, in relation to education and their identity, identifying this matter and targeting need uh, where it is. So it's a reality within education. It's something we have to take on board. And if we are serious about ensuring that every young person has an opportunity in life, then we have to make those interventions as early as possible. I call Mr. Loris Kelly. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And the Minister, in the first part of his answer, referred to free school meals and to think the Minister, you, you yourself, brought forward an initiative to increase the uh, uh, opportunity for people to apply based on income eligibility of some 16,000. Do you not believe, uh, Minister, that would be a better measure in terms of preschool play, recognising the fact that many people are on uh, incomes that are much less, 16,000, and working families are, particularly under pressure in terms of affordable childcare? Um, I, I wouldn't argue against the member in that point, and the fact that we brought in that criteria for free school meals entitlement is a recognition that many families here working are also facing uh, are, are in low incomes and are facing the challenges that come with low incomes. We have hesitated to review the, the entry criteria around social disadvantage in preschool settings because welfare reform has always been looming, uh, and I, that, has, that has delayed us in terms of implementing any, any review in that regard. However, if there is continued delay uh, to implementation of welfare reform, which is something I'm not arguing against, I have to say, then I may well move forward and introduce different criteria for preschool settings as well. I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Uh, the Department funds the Council for Integrated Education uh, to encourage and promote integrated education. The Council received £646,000 of public money last year uh, to fulfil its role. The funding available to them this year is £665,000. NICE's mission is to lead, promote and facilitate the development and growth of integrated education through a range of approaches, including innovation, influence and working with others. The Council has appointed a panel of associates to assist in fulfilling its role, in particular in, in relation to area planning. I have commissioned the Education Levy Boards, working in conjunction with the Council for Celtic Maintained Schools and engaging with other sectors to coordinate strategic planning in each board area to shape the future provision of education in that area. Given the respective roles of the organisations involved, it is clear that planning for new integrated education provision is dependent upon collaboration between uh, NACI, the boards and CCMS. It is the responsibility of the proposer of new integrated education provision to make the case for change based on robust evidence, which demonstrates demand is based on the creation of viable and sustainable provision in line with sustainable schools policy. And I call um, Mr. Agnew for. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his answer and declare an interest as a director of NICE. Could I ask the Minister, um, in this process, uh, what work is being done um, in recognising the, 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 the lack of Catholic maintained schools, which has transferred in the past, and how we can meet um, the demand for integrated education in areas where the, the, the Catholic sector is dominant? Well, I have not never, in my tenure, or I believe the previous education minister in their tenure, been responsible for bringing forward development proposals in relation to the control sector and the other sector. 
to convert into integrated sector. Uh, this is a matter for local communities. It is a matter for the parents who attend the schools of those local communities to make the, the sorts of decisions the member has outlined. It is not within my legislative remit to demand that any individual school or any sector brings forward development proposals to convert their school into integrated sector. This has to be uh, community-led, parent-led, school-led, and we fund the integrated sector with not an insignificant amount of money, it has to be said, to facilitate and assist in that process. Sir Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister has told us what isn't within his um, remit, but given that this is within his remit, and that is to ensure that all integrated schools actually um, you know, co are compliant with the, the legislation that establishes um, integrated schools, can the Minister outline what he's doing to, to deal with that problem? Um, I think there's been an interesting shift in positions over this last number of weeks, particularly from, from the Members' Party in relation to integrated education. Last week we had them voting against a motion in the Assembly which promoted and supported integrated education and called on me as Minister to live up to my statutory duties. The Members voted against that. And now we have a Member calling on me to uh, go around and carry out an audit of all the integrated schools in our society to see if they're fully living up to the legislation. I, I think my, my purposes or my role would be much better served living up to my statutory obligation uh, and the comments made by others in the chamber in relation to integrated education, other than what the member is seeking me to do to go around and start going through the books of every integrated school in our society. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, has the Minister discussed the implications of the Tracy judgment with the integrated sector? And when will he be making a, a statement to the House on this? Well, in relation to the implications of the Tracy judgment, I'm still awaiting a final, a final briefing from the Department's legal advisers in regards to that matter. So I would much prefer to wait on a full legal briefing from the, the Department's legal advisers in regards to that matter. And the, the House has had an opportunity uh, to discuss this matter. There was a motion before the Assembly only last week brought forward by the Alliance Party. Uh, it's the motion I refer to where some members of the House who were previously quite vocal in support of integrated education actually voted against uh, the facilitation and promotion of integrated education at that stage. So I'm more than happy if need be, and I, I'm still question marking my head as to why there's a need for me to make a statement to the House in relation to the most recent Tracy judgment, but I'll take that in consideration after I've had uh, discussions with the legal advisors. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he is aware that the Office of First and Deputy First Minister are proposing to remove uh, reference to integrated education as an indicator in the Good Relations Indicators uh, held by OFM DFM, and if he has considered the alternative suggestions uh, put forward in terms of inclusion of integrated education, and if so, will he support the inclusion of that in Good Relations uh, Indicators, given his statutory duty to uh, facilitate and promote integrated education? Uh, only, I have been aware of it through a number of interventions from the member, both I think possibly in the House, but certainly on the media, in relation to commentary around that. If the member wishes to provide me with more details in regards to that, I certainly will take a, a more careful and considered examination of it uh, and respond in due course. Mr. Roy Beggs. Question number seven. My capital announcement to the Assembly on the 22nd of January 2013 included two new primary school projects for East Antrim to be advanced in planning, namely current integrated primary school in Lorne and a new school to meet the needs of children in Island McGee and the surrounding area. An economic appraisal for the current integrated primary school project is currently being prepared. Allocation of capital budget to, pro, uh, to progress, design and construction will not be made until the economic appraisal has been approved. The Island McGee project has been withdrawn pending a development proposal on the consultation process by the North East Education and Library Board. I regret that that's time is up for the uh, list of questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Ian Mullen. Uh, could I ask the Minister to comment on the recent Institution uh, of Education report, which concluded that selective schooling systems increase inequality? Well, uh, it's, it's yet another useful uh, piece of research 
carried out beyond these shores, it has to be said as well, which perhaps gives an opportunity for political parties, educators in this society to tackle uh, the question of academic selection and its negative impact both on education and uh, our society. For supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, would the Minister also agree that the report provides further evidence, and I suppose I better say that if further evidence is needed, that academic selection prevents the creation of a broad social mix in schools, uh, which international experience shows uh, benefits all learners? Uh, the report does exactly what the member says. It provides further information in that regard. However, much, much of this information has been available from particularly the early 70s and going into the 80s. Whatever the motivations were for introducing of ac academic selection five or, or many, 60, odd dec 60 odd decades ago, those motivations no longer stack up. If the people were serious about that, it is a tool to increase social mobility. All the recent evidence, both from here, Britain, and internationally, tells us it does not promote social mobility. In fact, it restricts it. Uh, Ofsted recently said, and I know Ofsted was held by some in high regard in this chamber last week during a debate on inspection. Ofsted were quoted as saying, what academic selection does is stuff grammar schools full of middle class kids. Now, some may argue that should be the case. But international evidence also shows us that where you have a social mix within a school, an ability mix within a school, that the actual outcomes for all the children are actually better. So if we are serious about social mobility, if we're serious about uh, educational well-being of all our young people, and we're serious about an economy which has the skills to move forward and, and continue to move forward to the 21st century, then there is only one answer. You have to end academic selection. And Mr. Tom Buchanan is not in his place. I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Ahead of the Minister's statement on his capital plans tomorrow, could he give us any indication of the total value of the projects he intends to announce? I hope to be in a position tomorrow to announce projects somewhere in the region of £180 million moving forward. Uh, I, I could be in a position to stand up and, and read out a lengthy list of schools that are required to be built, and there's many, many schools in our society that require to be rebuilt. But what I've, I've made the conscious decision since coming into office that I announce a number of schools on each occasion, and I'm confident they can be moved forward in a reasonably um, quick period of time. And even with that, as I've reported to the House before, there can be delays. Ready for supplementary? Thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, regarding previous capital announcements, can the Minister give us any indication of how many projects are now in sight? Um, in my statement to the House in, the 20, in June 2012, I announced 18 new build school projects. One of these projects is complete. Seven are currently on site, and a further eight projects expected to move on site before the end of this current financial year. The remaining two schemes are at an earlier stage in development and are not expected to be on site until 15 16 financial year. In January 2013, I announced a further programme of 22 new builds. These projects were, and I announced at the time, in a very early stage of planning, and they continue to move through, our, through the economic appraisal stage and various design stages uh, set forth. Thank you. And I call Mr. Michael McGimsey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, will he bring forward, forward uh, proposals and recommendations now to make the South Eastern Li Education and Library Board membership both accountable and democratic, as opposed to the appointees that currently sit on that board? Thank you. Um, well, I, I accept the principle of accountable and democratic. The, the reasons why there has been such a lengthy delay in appointing elected representatives to the South Eastern Education and Library Board has been the elusive topic of ESA uh, and the continued commitments within at least two programmes for governments that ESA will be in place during the, the time frame of those uh, mandates of the executive. It's now clear to everyone that ESA is not going to happen. I intend to bring forward a paper to the executive, hopefully in the next number of weeks, which will set out the course and the pathway ahead, which will see uh, the South Eastern Education and Library Board, along with other boards, being collapsed down into one board, with elected representatives being on, in place. Mr. 
thank the, uh, the Minister for that answer. Uh, would he agree with me that the fact that he's now in a judicial review situation with parents of Newton Breda High School, uh, in fact, is an indication that he has been poorly served by this board because of their lack of connection and understanding of the views of the local community? Thank you. Well, I think that given the fact that that judicial review is sitting today and tomorrow, the least said is easily amended. Paul Free. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, Principal Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how many pupils who are currently attending Bali Community High School have been placed in other schools uh, for September when the school closes, and how many are yet to be placed? Uh, as of today, of the 94 pupils currently at Bali Community High School, 85 have been placed in other schools, with two pupils leaving the jurisdiction. The remaining seven pupils can be classified as follows. Four applications are currently considered by schools. Two pupils uh, with behavioural issues are being assisted to find placements. Uh, one of these has secured a placement, but there are still further details to be worked out. And one pupil's family is on holidays until next week and will be contacted upon their return. Free for a supplementary. I thank uh, the Minister for his answer. And given the fact that I had asked that similar or same question last week, last Monday, as a priority uh, for today, and it wasn't answered, does that just demonstrate, Minister, that uh, as with the question not being answered, the NELB had no real plan uh, involved to assist these children and the schools that would accommodate them going into the future? Well, I, I apologise if the member's uh, priority question was not responded to in the time scale to which it should have been. But the figures I've read out to the member there show clearly that there has been a considerable amount of work carried out here. Um, of the 94 pupils, 85 placed. Four other applications currently being considered, and one, one school or one pupil's family away on holidays. Uh, I, I, I think that the work has been carried out in relation to this matter, and children are being placed uh, following the closure uh, of the school in question. Uh, can the Minister comment on the recent Westminster Education Select Committee's findings that schools serving disadvantaged communities should be given additional support from government? Well, again, and this, this is reflective of Mr Millen's question as well and, and other questions uh, during this session, it's evident that where the greatest need is that government is required to make an intervention to ensure that the young people are given an uh, an advantage over the disadvantage they have been placed in through no fault of their own. And the, the reports from the Westminster Committee uh, and the evidence presented to the Westminster Committee are reflective of other such reports which have been published locally and elsewhere. Social disadvantage has a detrimental impact upon your educational outworkings and has to be tackled, and I believe government has a responsibility to do so. Well, Mr. Flamikan, what's up? Uh, can the Minister elaborate on the reasons behind, between, behind the link between disadvantage and poor educational attainment? Well, some of it may be tied into the educational experiences of the children's parent or parents. Uh, a child whose parents have had a good education and either are in employment and have the resources to assist a child with extracurricular activities and even in terms of an enhanced home life can assist that child's education journey and there's a, there's a significant link between the educational experience of the mother and of any uh, subsequent children coming through education. So parents with a good educational background are most likely to be employed, they're most likely to be, to be have uh, access to extracurricular activities on a, a family holiday, weekend activities, sporting activities, the swimming club, the local football club, all those things which cost three or four pounds ago, or sometimes up to as much as we all parents in the room will know what it costs uh, to send your child away in these extra cur cur curriculum activities or sporting activities, where it may be, all assist the child in its development and its educational development. Where a child is suffering from social disadvantage, those extracurricular activities won't be there. The parental experience or the educational experience of, of the parents most likely isn't there, so none of that is fed into the child's experiences. So if we want to break that cycle, uh, then I think we as a government have to step in and do so. Thank you. And I call Mr Ian McRae. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister um, confirm whether or not the budgets for education and library boards have been signed off? Uh, the, the budgets have not been confirmed as yet. Uh, there are still particular issues to be resolved, and one of those particular issues is the June monitoring rate. I think that's obviously disappointing news, and given the fact that there are um, people within boards who are being given notice of redundancies, does the Minister not accept that this is an important issue and must be dealt with with a matter of urgency? I totally agree with the matter, and I can ensure that I'm not dealing with it in a complacent manner. But the fact of the matter is that the budgets don't add up in terms of what is required by our education and library boards and what I as a department and minister have to give to them. Now, there are serious issues at play here. There's around, uh, I have put bids into the June monitoring round for £10 million for SEN, £10 million for redundancies, uh, other significant bids for maintenance, etc., to go into the boards, etc. And until June monitoring is resolved, then it is very difficult for me to predict what even my own department budget will be at the end, regardless of what the Education and Library Board's budgets uh, will be moving forward. But I will continue to attempt to resolve the matter, and I accept that it is a situation none of us want to be in. Can I call Mr. Samuel Gardner? Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, may I ask the Minister if he could tell me, in relation to his budget allocation that has not been spent and has failed uh, to return to the DFP in the year monitoring round? Well, uh, I, I'm not in a position to hold monies back from DFB that hasn't been spent. Uh, I'm proud to say and glad to say that I'm one of the very few departments that hasn't returned significant amounts of money back to DFP through the monitoring rounds, rather this monitoring round or previous monitoring rounds. And I always question, my question why departments have argued for such budgets when they're able to hand back tens of millions of pounds during the monitoring rounds. Uh, under the financial regulations I operate under, I cannot hold monies back from the monitoring rounds if I believe it is not to be spent, and that remains the case. I have no monies available uh, or not targeted at this stage in terms of my budgetary planning. Order. I call Mr Gardner for supplementary. Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for his reply, but are you, are you happy enough with the budget that you have and that you have sufficient to support all the educational needs? Uh, no, I have said since coming into office that the education budget does not suffice. Uh, and all departments faced a significant cuts in their budgets when the, the, the coalition government came into to play. Or the black grant was cut by billions, the capital budget uh, was cut by billions. It is one of the reasons why I cannot announce more schools tomorrow than uh, is the case. So, no, certainly, the education budget is far from healthy. Far from healthy. Our schools, our boards are all working under pressure. Uh, and we need to continue to identify ways of ensuring that education does uh, receive greater allocations, whether it's before the end of this CSR or as part of the next uh, round of negotiations around budgets, that education is properly funded moving forward if we want to build a stable society that everyone wishes for. Okay, and Mr Michael Copeland is not in his place. I call Ms Claire Sugden. Um. To ask the Minister if he has any plans to introduce programmes in school to encourage children to think about the differences around them? Um, we have programmes in schools uh, for children to do exactly that. Uh, a part of the CREATE policy is to ensure that young children start uh, interacting and engaging with others from different communities or different backgrounds, whether they be racial, social or whatever it may be. Uh, and many, many of our schools are already participating in programmes such as that. We also have obviously the shared education programme moving forward uh, and I hope to be in a in position in a number of weeks' time along with executive colleagues to announce uh, funding for continued shared education programme. So schools do have the access to courses. Uh, schools are carrying out such work but we also want to promote it and increase it further. Order and time is up. Uh, that concludes question time.